Hi there guys, Mr. Martin here again. Thank you so much for joining me now today. What we're going to be looking at is the first in our approaches into studying memory and that's going to be the biological approach. So what we hope to gain from this video is linking the psychology of memory to specific brain areas, to the nervous system and to the specific chemicals that make the brain work. So we hope to reach some kind of meaningful conclusion about the biology of the brain and how it helps us to remember things. So let's begin. We think in terms of short-term and long-term memory. You can look at the previous video to have an idea of what those two things are. But if we're thinking in terms of those two structures, those two ideas, then short-term memory appears to be mainly processed in the prefrontal cortex. Now, in terms of where your prefrontal cortex is, if you think of where your eyes are, just above where your eyes are inside your head, that's your prefrontal cortex. It's quite a big area of the brain, but when we give someone a task to do involving the short-term memory, and we're scanning their brain at the same time, it's the prefrontal cortex that seems to light up. So there seems to be some kind of link between the two. In terms of long-term memory, the most important part of the brain that seems to be relevant to long-term memory is this area here that's highlighted in red and a little bit of yellow as well. This is your hippocampus. And the hippocampus is mainly for memory. Now, it seems to be that the uh, hippocampus can actually have new brain cells born in it all the time. It's actually very rare for your brain to have any new brain cells laid down. So the very fact that the hippocampus is, well, first of all, linked to long-term memory and seems to have new nerve cells born in it would suggest to us that new memories are actually being added into it. Secondly, the hippocampus appears to be larger in some people compared to others, especially in terms of people that rely on their memory. So uh, a very good psychologist called Maguire in the, uh, the year 2000 actually did a little test with taxi drivers. Taxi drivers, of course, are famous for having the knowledge. This is a comprehensive, almost incredibly detailed view of London, a map of London inside their head. They can reliably take you anywhere from anywhere in the city. They're absolutely incredible. If you look at their hippocampi, they seem to be so much bigger than in some other people. So it seems to get bigger, especially in terms of spatial information and bigger memories like that. Very interesting. If we ever think about the specific chemicals inside the brain, well, again, thinking about long-term memory here, it seems to result due to something called long-term potentiation. This research uh, was done a long time ago, way back in the 1940s. But basically, this guy, Hebb, is looking inside the synapses of the brain. He's looking at how the nerve cells connect to one another. And what he's viewing here is that if you repeatedly stimulate these nerve cells, the signal gets stronger. So what we might be looking at here on the screen is memory starting to be laid down. The initial encoding, if you like, of the memory results in maybe a few chemicals flying between nerve cells. The more that you remember that, the more that you use that nerve pathway inside your head, the more chemicals get added to it. So the more uh, signal there's going to be, it's going to be uh, stimulated. You're going to have more of, uh, of a memory there. So perhaps long-term memory is then to long-term potentiation, the laying down of new circuits inside the brain. We say perhaps because we don't know for sure, but it is certainly interesting evidence nonetheless. If we have a think about other supporting evidence for this, this guy, of course, Clive Weaver, we looked at before, his specific condition that resulted in almost zero short-term memory was due to a specific viral disease, viral encephalitis it was called, so we are thinking that due to Clive results, damage to the brain results sometimes in severe and pterograde amnesia. He cannot put down new memories into his head. If we think about it in terms of car crashes, you might know that if you hit your head really, really hard, then it can result in memory loss. Very famous study was done with patient KF. He suffered a motorcycle accident. He bled into his brain. And it turns out that some memories were actually switched off. So we can reliably tell that those areas of the brain were due, uh, were actually encoding some memories and other areas of the brain were largely unaffected. And we think in terms of disease again and other conditions, for example, neurosyphilis, which is actually a sexually transmitted disease that 
works its way up into the brain, also has an impact on memory. Um, please, I implore you, don't Google neurosyphilis because you'll see lots of people with holes in their head. It's not very nice at all. Just trust me, it does have an effect on memory. Key study to think about in this area, guys, the biology of memory is Scoville and Milner, 1957. It's a study they called the case of H.M. The guy you can see down there, that's H.M. you're looking at. Henry Molaison, his name was. A really, really nice guy. There's lots of interviews with him on YouTube that you should check out after this. I might put a few down in the comments below. But basically, H.M. comes in to see William Scoville, this guy here, who's actually a brain surgeon. H.M., as it turns out, has really, really severe uh, epilepsy. He cannot function day-to-day -day life because his epilepsy is so bad. So what Scoville does is he basically removes some of his brain. He takes out a little bit on the left-hand side and an even bigger bit on the right-hand side. So this is what your brain looks like over here. This is what H.M.'s brain looks like over here, or looked like. I think he's long dead now. What's interesting is that H.M. came back to Scoville a little bit later on and said that he felt fine, but that his uh, wife and his children were noticing some really, really severe memory uh, effects on him as well. So what Scoville did with his colleague Milner is put together a little study, mainly involving interview with HM himself and also with his family. They were looking for any specific change in his memory since the surgery. What they found was, well, the first thing that they found was the oldest memories that he had. These are declarative memories, so memories of his children being born, memories of his wedding day. Those were intact. He could remember them really, really well, suggesting that what we're finding here might not always account. But the massive damage, as you can see here, there's a huge damage to his hippocampus and other areas as well, led to an inability in HM to recall the most recent declarative memories that he processed. So, for example, he couldn't remember uh, anything from around the time of the operation. He couldn't really remember the run-up to the operation either. So his most recent declarative memories are entirely gone. We also find that he's completely unable to encode new ones. You'll tell him something, he'll process it and say, oh yeah, that's nice. And then he will completely forget that you'd ever told him that a few seconds later. Interestingly enough, his procedural memories were unaffected, so he still could learn new tasks. He was actually very good at learning how to draw in a mirror, so-called mirror drawing tasks. But what we find is this declarative memory that seems to be impacted here, suggesting that it's declarative memory that's stored in the hippocampus. Procedural memories might be stored elsewhere. Always nice to evaluate these studies. This is a case study we're looking at. It's not an experiment. It's just one guy we're looking at. So the information we get is very, very in-depth, very, very detailed, which is a big plus. But of course, because it's just this one guy, because it's so abnormal, there's a lack of generalizability. What relevance does HM have to the rest of the world? Probably not very much. If we're evaluating the biological approach in regard to memory, there's a few things we can say. In terms of strengths, this links in very, very nicely with other approaches. For example, sleep and dreams, we can look at actually how um, memories are laid down when you're sleeping, how they are consolidated, how they're processed, how you can even relive memories inside your head through your dreams. So there's a nice link there. When we do our later videos on sleep and dreams, you'll see those links start to appear. Secondly, there is a real world impact of this research. For example, we can predict the effects of brain damage or we can avoid harmful memory loss. Both of these things very, very key for doctors, especially for patients with brain damage or patients that are about to undergo brain surgery. This will help the surgeon, first of all, avoid memory loss so it doesn't cut into any areas where memories might be stored. And it also helps to plot the course of the disease, especially in terms of things like Alzheimer's, dementia, those kind of things, which are becoming all the more common nowadays. In terms of uh, weaknesses to this model, well, yeah, we've got biological evidence. Brain parts light up when we're asking people to remember things, but brain parts don't light up when we're asking them about memory processes. For example, rehearsal. Well, we know that short-term memory occurs in the prefrontal cortex, but where does rehearsal occur? Rehearsal seems to be very dark when you're remembering, repeating something back to yourself. So where does that occur in the brain? We're not entirely sure. Second weakness here is that this approach is hugely indebted to abnormal case studies. People like Clive Wearing, people like H.M. standing here. Well, yeah, these are abnormal, but how relevant are they to other humans as a whole? Probably not very much. 
So in terms of key concept guides, not many to remember about the biological approach. Certainly if you remember the word hippocampus, and that's where long-term memories, specifically declarative memories are stored, that's good. Also, if you remember that long-term potentiation idea, the fact that the more that you're working through a neural circuit, the more that it's getting built up, then that would be a really good thing as well. Okay, guys, that's everything for this video. Nice short one today. Uh, our next video, we'll be looking at the cognitive approach to memory. Much more to say about that one because memory is pretty much a cognitive aspect. But until then, guys, I hope you have a lovely day. We'll see you in that video and uh, we'll see you later. Cheers.